we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, if you're a guest with us uh, and can fill that out, we can uh, give you a little bit more information about who we are and a little bit more information for our church. Um, on the other side of that Connect card, there are some things coming up. Uh, this week, National Day of Prayer Breakfast. If you are planning to attend that, and that will be uh, Thursday um, at 7 a.m., and uh, I think we'll have some uh, good food and, and kind of need to count uh, so we can know who's, who's coming for that food, please fill that out uh, so we can make preparations for that at 7 a.m. Um, there's a Young at Heart sign up, and then also uh, graduation. It's crazy, that's May already, <laughs> and uh, uh, Graduate Sunday is right around the corner, uh, especially our, our college graduates, upper class graduates. If you know some of them that are graduating that aren't here every weekend uh, that, that would hear this announcement, please reach out to them or fill that out. Even if you, you know, write a note in the Connect card, I think they may be graduating and we can check in on that and uh, check in with them. Uh, those are the ones that sometimes get tricky uh, to, to find out, especially if they're not here every weekend and they're, and they're away. Um, uh, the fundraiser, youth fundraiser, continues for the next couple of Sundays. So this Sunday and next Sunday, and, and several have already visited that. That's at the uh, Faith at Home Center. So that's flipped around, and we have a youth fundraiser there. There's still, it's, it's all numbered envelopes, and uh, you can choose whatever, however much you, uh, you feel led to, to give to that. And that will go to, to help with our summer camp and help reduce the price for every youth that goes to that camp. We greatly appreciate that. Make sure when you grab those, we've had a few people grab them. There is a magnet in there. Uh, it's about a note card size and then a thank you card. Make sure, especially the magnet, uh, make sure you grab that out of the envelope when, when you grab those things. So we want you to, to have that uh, and to continue praying for our youth. Uh, Mission McDuffie is also coming up. So there's a the box there, just some of the needs and things coming up for Mission McDuffie. And another reminder for Mother's Day, uh, finally for Mother's Day, we will have uh, two services like we have in the past. And I want uh, there's a note there, free family photo that day. So uh, I think our own Maggie Allen will be there and uh, she's graciously uh, uh, doing photos for families. So bring your family one of those Mother's Day services and um, just enjoy worship together on May 8th um, on Mother's Day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, uh, during this time of year, um, the busyness of it, Lord, we, we do give thanks to mothers, school teachers, those that are graduating, um, just a lot of milestones and things coming up, God, that we want to give thanks. But most of all, we want to give thanks to who you are and that you've placed those people in our lives that make such an impact to us. God, and most of all, we give thanks for your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Phone on before the service starts. Some of you were clever about this and you wondered why we didn't sing this song last week when we talked about the return of Jesus. Well, because we're going to sing it this week because it helps connect the return of Jesus with our mission to go and tell the world we have a message, we have an urgency, and that's what we're going to focus on in our time together as we sing. So let's stand and sing together. These are the days of your life. One more verse together.
take the name of Jesus with you. Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and woe, it will joy and comfort you. Take it there you go. Let your spirit be standing for the reading of God's Word. Our Old Testament passage is from Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. They were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole world is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Our New Testament reading is Romans 10, 13 through 17. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you can all have a seat if you would. Let's pray together. God, we have learned so much about what you're doing in the world. We hear so much about what you're doing in the world even now. And we've spent the last couple of months praying for those men and women who are specifically here in the United States taking the gospel to people who, who don't know and haven't heard and the passion they have to share your son's name and salvation with them. God, help us even as we sit here in this place, be focused on you, be focused on what we can do to be a part of your mission, in Jesus' name, amen. We live in a Christian nation, that's what some people say. 
Maybe that's why they often ask, why do we need missionaries here? There are places in North America where there are very few churches. People are very open to conversation, but nine times out of 10, they have not heard of Jesus. There is no pastors, there is no people can share the gospel with them. There's lives that can be made whole with the gospel. And we're watching God change people's hearts and change people's lives. But I wish people knew how many more laborers we need in the mission field, because it's more than we can handle. Church planting is hard. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We need all the help that we can get, and that's what Annie does. It allows for more laborers to come here. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering unites us all, big and little, young and old, black and white. We all give because we know that when we do, our communities will look more like this. And we all give because we know there's a name and a face on the other side of that gift. This offering, this gift that we're giving to and that everyone else is giving to, it does have a face. It's my face. This is the body. This is the body of Christ. That's what any Armstrong means to me. You might actually want to get your hymnal out for this as we sing this song. It's an old song. It's one of my favorites. It's also got all the, the best words in it. It's hymn number 575. You're also welcome to sing from the screen, but one way or the other, let's stand and let's sing of our Redeemer together.
able to see the pain. looking out for good testimony songs that tell the story that sometimes we have a hard time putting words to. This song was released a little while ago, I just recently heard it, but it tells the story, and it tells the story extremely well.
All right, kids, come on up. Ben has a message just for y'all. So come on. All right, here we go. Mic on. There we go. <laughs> Good to see you all, boys and girls. Good to see you. We have a big group coming down here. All right. Wow, we are already in May. It is coming up summertime very soon and in the school year. Are you all excited about that? No, yes, um, some don't know. <laughs> uh, let, it will be here soon and uh, uh, be on the lookout too. I know Tiny Kid, Teen Kid will be ending. We'll be giving schedules too about kid stuff going on this summer, okay? All right, we have a lot of exciting kids stuff that will be going on this summer. Um, today we are talking about missions and evangelism, and last week, remember y'all brought up uh, some of the banks and stuff for Annie Armstrong uh, mission, and that, remember, we were talking about our missionaries here in the state of, of Georgia, but evangelism and missions goes all throughout the world, so I wanted to show you this poster, and Maylee's going to help me. You can stand right here. This is a unique poster because it's kind of long, but and I have it in my office. I took it down so I could show you all what this poster is of. Here we go. Does anybody know, cover up the word right here, <laughs> anybody know what this poster might be of? Yeah. Great Wall of China. That's right. That's right. That's why it's so long. And actually, if you look, the mountain range goes over and over, and, and the wall's like way over here, and it comes along the ridge of this. This wall goes over 13,000 miles, 13,000 miles. And um, some of it's built up like this, some of it has been tumbled down and, and is not as complete as this, but this was a part I got to see. And I have this up, not to remind me just here, but to really remind me of the people that live here that I got to see. And uh, 1.4 billion people and growing in China. That's a lot. That's a lot. And um, when I was there, I got to see some people that, that know about Jesus, and we got to meet some students and some other people and tell them about Jesus. And my big message today is every single person in this world needs to know about Jesus, right? Don't you agree with that? Yeah. And there's nations like this that are really, really, really large. And then what I just remember being with some of the believers there, there's just a lot of people, a lot. Everywhere we went, there were just thousands. And actually in the square area where we were, just millions of people. Um, that's a lot of people that need to know about Jesus. And we can be a part of it here, right where we are in our schools and in our communities, but we always need to pray for our missionaries. They have a big job. And, and some of them, I, I just can't imagine the job they have before them of how many people. And we need to pray uh, for our missionaries and, and for other missionaries to join them and to tell people about Jesus, because that's the best news of all. Uh, it doesn't matter if you live here or over in China, or wherever, Africa, anywhere in the world. The best news you could ever hear is Jesus is your Savior and died for you and can rescue you and you have an eternal life with him. So let's pray right now for all our missionaries. Last, last week we prayed for our missionaries in Georgia. Let's pray for all our missionaries today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these children and for the upcoming end of the school year. Lord, help us to be on mission at our church, or at our, church, at our school, in our neighborhood and uh, with our family at home, and to help share and show the love of Jesus. And God, we remember as we do these things, all the missionaries around the world that have the great task before them to share Jesus. And sometimes it can seem overwhelming, but God, you can do amazing, miraculous things with your message going out from the missionaries to other believers, and then for them to share to others. It's kind of like dominoes that... that other people will hear from one to another. God, help us to be a part of that. Thank you for these children, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this time uh, you can go to Children's Church. Those that are going that way, two and three years old, we have Children's Church in the nursery area, and then K-4 through first grade, uh, Children's Church in the chapel.
Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you here today. I want to again apologize about the heat in here. Our air conditioner has decided to give up the ghost. Uh, it is dead. It is done. Uh, you can stick a fork in it. And uh, the new air conditioner is just, uh, you can imagine with the supply chain issues, it's still a few weeks away. So uh, we're, we're going to do the best that we can. We may have to end up moving into the gym here eventually if we can't get things uh, going uh, quicker. But, uh, but we are aware it's a little warm. And uh, feel free to, to take your bulletin and, and fan yourself, whatever you need to do. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully next week, it looks like we'll have maybe some cool night before Mother's Day next week. We will be in two services. I guarantee you the, the first service probably will be a cooler service. So you may want to come to that one, right? So uh, just FYI. And remember, there will, we'll have these, these wonderful opportunity to get a family picture made uh, after both of those services. So please come and be a part of that. Bring your family, bring your mother, grandmother, aunt. Uh, neighbor, whoever is a, is a motherly figure to you, and we will celebrate her and enjoy our time together. So don't forget that. And, uh, and I know what it's like to forget things. And, and I am realizing the older I get, there's this weird phenomenon where I will be in a room, and I'll walk into the next room and say, now what did I come in here for? <laughs> Anybody else ever do that? It's like you step into the room, and it's just like your brain was erased. And it's like, now, I came in here for something. What was I going to do? Now, if I'm going into the kitchen, there's no question what I'm going to do, right? I, that, that one's easy. But if I'm going into other rooms in the house, it just it, it floors me. So I looked into this. I thought, I'm getting old. I'm losing my mind. It has nothing to do with age. So feel better about yourself. It has nothing to do with age. There's this phenomenon called the threshold effect. And it's this weird thing where when you move into a new room or you leave the house or, or whatever, you come in the house, it's like your brain realizes you're in a different place and it like erases the hard drive of, of what it considers to be unimportant information, which oftentimes it's wrong, right? Because sometimes it is important information that it, it tends to erase. Well, sometimes this happens to us as followers of Jesus Christ. We suffer from a threshold effect. John, uh, Jesus tells us in John chapter 20, verse 21, this is after his resurrection, he tells the disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus sends us from one room to the next, from one building to the next, from one town to the next. Jesus sends us out on an urgent mission. As we've sung and heard in Scripture this morning, we are a sent people, but we struggle to stay focused on that mission. Just like I might walk from one room to the next and forget, why am I here? Why am I going? What am I doing? It's like sometimes we leave these doors on Sunday morning from worship. We go home and we forget, why am I here? Where am I going? What am I doing? We lose sight of the mission of why we are here, why we exist. And that's why it's so important for us to continually remind ourselves about this, about the Great Commission. Uh, if you've been around here any length of time, you've heard me preach probably a dozen sermons on the Great Commission. And there's just one Great Commission, so they all kind of start sounding the same. I understand that, right? It can be a bit repetitive. But we have to be reminded of this. You know, I mean, if, if the baptistry was being used every week, if, if we were just, you know, all of us going out with people to Jesus left and right, that kind of reminds us on its own, doesn't it? So I'm going to keep on preaching this until we get there, until we start to see this happen. And, and that's also why you'll find our church's purpose statement in so many places, because our church's purpose statement reminds us who we are, why we're here, where we're going, and what we're supposed to be doing. So when we have that threshold effect, you walk out of your Sunday school class down the hallway, hopefully you'll see this somewhere. You walk up to the back of your car, maybe you've got a sticker on it with that logo on it, to remind you of our mission, our purpose here, which is loving God, loving people, and making disciples of Jesus from all nations. Say that with me. Loving God, loving people, and making disciples of Jesus from all generations. That last part's not up there. It's a little long, so we left it off. The Great Commission is at the heart of who we are as a church. It's at the heart of who we are as Georgia Baptists and Southern Baptists. It's the heart of our missionary agencies. It's the purpose of the cooperative program. We are a mission-minded, gospel-centered people. 
And this is reflected in the next statement in the Baptist faith and message, which says it is the duty and privilege of every follower of Christ and of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to endeavor to make disciples of all nations. The birth of man's spirit by God's Holy Spirit means the birth of love for others. Missionary effort on the part of all rests thus upon a spiritual necessity of the regenerate life and is expressly and repeatedly commanded in the teachings of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has commanded the preaching of the gospel to all nations. It is the duty of every child of God to seek constantly to win the loss to Christ by verbal witness undergirded by a Christian lifestyle and many other methods in harmony with the gospel of Christ. Now we're going to unpack this this morning. I think one of the great threats to the Southern Baptist Convention, one of the great threats to churches like us and to God's redemptive work in the world is us losing sight of the importance and urgency of the Great Commission. And I won't go into it this morning. I've done it before, all the statistics about the decline in baptism and church attendance and membership and, and, and kids who go off to college and, and, and go off from church. and They don't come back. I'm not going to go into all that today. But Dr. Ronnie Floyd, I heard him say this once. It's a great quote. He said, the great commission will become the great omission if it's not our great obsession. And I think that's where we are today. What is our obsession as a church? What is your obsession as a Christian? You know, I think about it like, like a basketball game, right? The only way to win a basketball game is to put the ball through the hoop, right? You've got to put the ball through the hoop. You can, have, you can dribble well, you can, you can pass great, you can have all the fancy footwork you want, but if you can't get the ball in the hoop, you're not going to win, right? Well, a lot of churches, we are so focused on our passing game or we're so focused on our footwork and looking cool or whatever, that we're not putting the ball through the hoop. We're not winning people to Jesus Christ. So we're failing. Our text today is the Great Commission is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And again, for some of you, this is new information. For most of us, this is a refresher course. But it's something we need to keep focused in our heart and mind. Jesus came to them and said, and these are, you know, these are the last words of Jesus in Matthew's gospel, so it, it must be important, right? Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we can break the Great Commission down in a very simple, easy to remember way. It's a one, three, three. One command with three principles and three promises. So let's look at the one command. The one command in this passage is to make disciples of all nations. Now we call it the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion, because this is a command. This is a mandate from Jesus Christ. You look at the Greek, it is the only word in the whole passage that's an imperative. Make disciples of all nations. Now, this is a command that Jesus repeated often. We've already looked at this command in John 20, 21. We see it here in Matthew 28. Uh, Jesus gives it in Mark. He gives it in Luke. He gives it in Acts. Probably the two most famous are the ones here in Matthew 28 and Acts 1, 8, which says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But even at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he calls the disciples, particularly when he calls Andrew, J Peter, James, and John, he says, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. He called them to go catch and bring others to him, to make Disciples. This mandate is something Jesus modeled throughout his ministry. He was always going and telling and calling people to follow him, making disciples. People often wonder, what is God's will for my life, right? You know, high school kids, college kids, you, you know, looking at your career, or your, you know, what are you going to get your degree in? Who are you going to marry? What's God's will for my life? Well, Jesus makes it clear. Here is one overarching will that God has 
for your life if you're a Christian, and it's this, that as you go throughout your life, you look for opportunities to share Jesus so that people can come to faith in Him. That is God's will for your life. Are you doing that? If you're not, then you're not in God's will. You're not living in obedience. We need to remember two things about this command. The first thing about the command to make disciples of all nations, it's all inclusive. It's all inclusive. I think one of the problems that we have in churches today is people think that's for the experts. That's for the professionals, right? That's why we have missionaries. That's why we have pastors. It's their job to go and to preach and to proclaim the gospel and to go on mission and make disciples. This couldn't be further from the truth. It's not just up to me. It's not just up to the missionaries on the field. It's not just up to your deacon or your Sunday school teacher. Lee Scarborough, one of the greatest Baptist preachers and evangelists, put it like this. The divine obligation of soul winning, of evangelism, of making disciples, the divine obligation rests without exception. In other words, nobody gets a pass. Nobody gets an excuse. It rests without exception upon every child of God. The Christian receives the essence of this obligation and call. When? At the time of his salvation. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, from that moment on, you have this command. You have this call. You have this commission. It's all-inclusive. Secondly, it's all-encompassing. See, another mistake I think we make In addition to thinking, oh, this is for the preachers and the missionaries and the super Christians, the super spiritual ones, that's for them. We also mistakenly think that evangelism and missions are programs. Are the programs of the church? Listen, I grew up with RAs and and high school Baptist young men, and then you had your GAs and your acting, you had your mission friends. These were missions organizations. Missions was a program. Missions is what we did on Wednesday night. We think that evangelism and missions is just something else the church does. You know, it's upward basketball, it's trunk or treat, it's VBS. It's, it's just a program of the church. We even have had committees, right? We had an evangelism committee. We had a missions committee. Now they're combined into the go and tell committee, right? It's a committee. That's their job. Well, yes, we can have committees. We can have programs and events and campaigns to help us accomplish the Great Commission, to help us go and tell our neighbors and the nations, but listen, missions and evangelism is more than just a program of the church. It's our purpose. It's our assignment. Both as a church and as individual followers of Jesus. We are called and commanded to make disciples of all nations, not just sometime, not just when it's at the church, not just as a program. It's all-encompassing. It's all of our life. Now, you may be saying, well, David, what does it mean to make disciples? Well, disciple, uh, literally, the, the, the Greek word disciple means a, a pupil, a, a, a student, a learner. You're somebody who follows a teacher to learn to be like them. So to be a follower of Jesus Christ, which means you have to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple. Well, making disciples is our mission. Again, that's the only imperative in the whole passage. Make disciples. The other verbs modify that imperative. Go, baptize, and teach. Modify the mandate to make disciples. So how do we do that? Well, simply put, we tell other people about Jesus. We call them to follow Him. We help them along the journey of becoming more like Jesus. And that's what the three verbs in this passage give us. The three principles, the three ways in which we can make disciples of all nations. So let's look at those. The first is go. That's the first uh, modifier to make disciples that we see. Go. We need to intentionally pursue people. Now let's unpack that word go. It's a short word, but there's a lot in it. What does it mean to go? Well, first it means praying. It means praying. Praying for our own efforts. To make disciples, praying for the people that God places upon our heart and gives us opportunity to share Christ with. Praying for those who can go places we'll never go and, and, and meet people we'll never meet. Prayer is essential to evangelism as it is to everything we do as Christians. Paul often 
would write to churches and say, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul encouraged people to pray for him. That God would give him an opportunity, that God would give him boldness, that God would give him the words to say. But then Paul also prayed. He prayed for the gospel to go forth and bear fruit around the world. He prayed for other people as well. But Paul put his feet to his prayers. He put action to his... He didn't just pray and check it off. He did something about it. He went and shared the gospel. He went and planted churches. He put feet to his prayers. We as a church rightly spend time praying for missionaries, learning about missionaries. We have weeks of prayer throughout the year, but we can't just stop at praying. There's a second aspect to that. Praying and giving. Now, through our tithes and our offerings here at First Baptist Church, we give to support mission efforts and evangelism efforts to reach our neighbors and the nations, right? We, we go local and global as we give. So when you give, you're enabling us to do things like the spring extravaganza the other week where the gospel was proclaimed numerous times. People heard the good news of Jesus, had an opportunity to respond. When you give through us, through the cooperative program, you're supporting missionaries and evangelistic efforts in the United States and around the world. We do the same thing through the Mission Georgia offering, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, and we're still behind on our goal for this year. At the Lottie Moon offering. These are ways that we give to empower and equip others to go places that we can't. To reach those 1.4 billion people in China, for example. You and I probably won't ever go to China. But there are people there that are reaching others with the good news of Jesus Christ. So we pray, we give, but again, it's not enough. You can't just say, well, I pray for missionaries and I give. My job is done. Because what's the word we're talking about? That two little... Two little uh, letter word, what is it? Go. So it, it kind of implies you have to do what? Go, right? Now we as a church give opportunities for us to go again to our neighbors and to the nations. Throughout the year, you can go on mission. You can go to Honduras, West Virginia, Gatlinburg. You can be a part of disaster relief efforts through the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. You, there are so many other opportunities that we give for you to go on mission uh, in the United States and around the world, but also we go locally through Mission McDuffie that Ben mentioned, through BBS, through Upward Basketball, through so many other events, drive through Nativity, are ways that we can go locally. And my hope and prayer is that everyone at First Baptist Church can do at least one of those things every year. Okay, I'm not saying you've got to go to Honduras or West Virginia or Gatlinburg every year. Some people <laughs> would gladly do that. But you can go by being a part of Mission McDuffie. You can go by helping with VBS, you can go by being a part of an event like Trunk or Treat or the Spring Extravaganza or Drive Through Nativity. And I hope and prayers that we would all do that, but there's a danger to this. Again, we get into this mindset, and, and I know because I'm the same way. You get into this mindset where you kind of, it's like one and done, right? You go on a mission trip and you're like, I've done it. I've done mission trip now. I can check that off and I can move on. I've done my duty to the Great Commission. That's not how that works. Yes, going includes an intentional, maybe one-time effort or being a part of a special event or an outreach program, but that Greek word for go carries with it this idea of continuous going. A better translation is as you go or going now, therefore. Paul, uh, Jesus is saying that as you go about your daily life, Make disciples. Not just on occasion, not just for a special emphasis, but throughout your daily life. At work, at school, at the grocery store, when you're on vacation, at the ball field, with your kids. Have your eyes open and your heart ready to share the gospel when the Spirit gives you that opportunity. That's what it means to go. Now, I want to pause right here. It's probably helpful at this point for us to agree on some definitions, right? Because the, the name of the sermon and this article, The Baptist Faith and Message, is evangelism and missions. What's the difference? Well, you know, we, we kind of use those terms interchangeably sometimes. Well, we can think of evangelism like this. Evangelism is the church's calling, the church's commission, to go and tell others the good news of salvation so as 
to give them an opportunity to respond in repentance and faith. That's evangelism. So if you go and you share with somebody your personal testimony and what Jesus has done for you, and you encourage them to do the same, you're doing evangelism. It's the first step in making disciples. You've got to first proclaim the gospel so they can respond to it and become a follower of Jesus. And again, our church provides lots of programs and events in our community to do just that. But listen, if we do anything as a church that doesn't proclaim the gospel and give people an opportunity to respond, if we do anything that doesn't call people and equip people to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're failing. If we do anything that does not advance the Great Commission, it's not worth our time, effort, or resources. Because that's what we're about. That's why we're here. Now, when we say evangelism, we usually mean that basic idea of sharing the gospel, leading people in faith to Jesus. Whether that's us as a church reaching our community or you as an individual reaching somebody in your life. But once we kind of move beyond that immediate local as-you-go context, then we kind of start to use a different term. And that's the word missions. Missions, and that's plural, right? Mission, the mission that we have is evangelism. It is the Great Commission. But missions, plural, is our strategy for taking the gospel to the ends of the earth through evangelism, education, and meeting needs. And listen, God has called us to do this simultaneously. We are simultaneously supposed to reach our neighbors and the nations. We are simultaneously supposed to focus on Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It's not like, okay, we're going to focus on Jerusalem, and when everybody here in Thompson is saved, then we'll worry about the rest of the world. No. We are to do both. And our missions often include compassion ministries like education and and, and helping, again, you know, fight illiteracy. It includes meeting people's needs. It could be medical. It could be hunger. It could be disaster relief. It could be fighting human trafficking. We, we use these ways to meet people's needs for the purpose of pointing them to Jesus Christ. But our missionary efforts must include evangelism. Again, if it doesn't include the preaching of the gospel and an opportunity to respond, we have no business doing it. Now, there are people in churches out there that are against that idea. They think that proselytizing is wrong. Right? That's what they call it. They call it proselytizing. I don't like that word. It's evangelism. I'm not trying to just convert somebody to my religion. I'm trying to save somebody from hellfire. I'm trying to proclaim the gospel so that people will know the love and peace of Jesus Christ. Okay, I don't care if they join my church or not. I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to go to heaven. I want them to know the peace and the joy and the love that I know in Jesus Christ. So I'm not interested in proselytizing someone to my religion, but that's what people will use, the word proselytizing. And they'll say, oh, that's, that's cultural imperialism. Oh, that, that's religious bigotry. You should never go to somebody of a different faith or no faith and try to win them over to your faith. They couldn't be more wrong. And so what these churches will do is that they will feed the hungry, clothe the naked, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll send money to help with this, that, and the other. They do all of the social justice and all these meeting needs, and that's it. Nothing about Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father. They don't believe that the name of Jesus is the only name given under heaven by, when, by which we must be saved. And so they stop short of that. But listen, if all you're doing is helping people with medical needs and with clothes and with food, then how are you any different than the United Way? How are you any different than the Red Cross? How are you any different than any other wonderful service organization out there helping people? You're no different. The church then becomes just a service organization. That's not what we're here for. We're here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, sharing Jesus with people to lead them to saving faith is not bigotry. It is not intolerant. It is not hateful. In fact, I'd say it's the most loving thing you can ever do for someone. If you, guys, you guys probably know the magician duo. They're kind of comedian magicians. Penn and Teller. You ever heard of Penn and Teller? You know, Teller's the little guy that doesn't talk. Penn's the big guy with the, with the ponytail, right? Well, Penn is actually an atheist. And I saw a video, this was a number of years ago, uh, and he was talking about, I think he was on an airplane flight, and, uh, and somebody next to him started witnessing to him. And people were like, well, weren't you offended 
you know, wasn't, you know, wasn't that insensitive and hateful of them? And he gives a response. Now, I'm not going to show you the video because it's one of those videos where he's got the phone locked down here. And it's like they're looking up his nose, and that's just uncomfortable. By the way, listen, if you ever are FaceTiming with somebody, don't do it like this. Do it like this, please. That's free. I'm not, you have to pay me for that one. But, uh, but yeah, don't, don't do it like this. So anyway, so I want to read to you what he said. He said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't, and he uses that word proselytize. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell. Now remember, he's an atheist, so he doesn't think that. But he says, if you do, and you think that it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. From the words, from the mouth of an atheist, he's 100% right. If what we believe about the Word of God is true, the most unloving thing you can do is to know that somebody is lost and not tell them about Jesus. We must make disciples. We do it by going. That includes praying, giving, and going. We evangelize. But then secondly, part of making disciples is we baptize. So we intentionally go after people, but then we also involve them in a local church. Now, to be baptized means that you have come to the point where you realize that you're lost in your sins, you've repented of your sins, and you've put your, 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 your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ for salvation, right? That's the basic. So you're not baptized till you know you've given your life to Jesus Christ. So you're a follower of Jesus, and you want to proclaim that to people, and you want to identify with his church. That's baptism. It's the way that followers of Jesus obey first, right? It's the first act of obedience is to be baptized. So I want to ask you this morning first, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you know that if you die today, you'd go to heaven and you've never been baptized, what's stopping you? What's holding you back? My prayer today is that you would joyfully come today. And listen, there's no shame in saying, you know what, I've been a Christian for 30 years, I've never been baptized. But God has spoken to my heart today. And now I want to come and I want to joyfully go through the waters of baptism. I, I pray that you would make that decision today. But when Jesus tells us to baptize disciples in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, what he's doing also is he's instructing us to include these new disciples within a community of disciples who identify themselves in the name of the triune God, a church. God doesn't save people and leave them orphans. He brings them into a family of faith. Jesus doesn't call people to follow him individually with no thought or commitment to, to anyone else. He always called a group of disciples. Because discipleship really can only happen within the context of other disciples. Within the context of a local church. You think, and discipleship actually happens best in in small groups as well. I mean, think about it. Jesus, he taught the crowds, but he taught deeper truth to the twelve, and he reserved his deepest teachings for three, for Peter, James, and John. Discipleship happens best in small groups, and that's why Sunday school and other small groups in our church are so vital. So we evangelize, we baptize, we intentionally pursue people, we involve them in the church, and then third, we teach, we invest in them through discipleship. And again, that's what Jesus was doing with the twelve every day. As they walked along the road, as they got up and sat down and ate together, he was training them not only to be disciples, but to then go out and make disciples. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't do it alone. I encourage you, deepen your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Deepen your spiritual growth as a part of a small group Bible study. And beyond that, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to consider who God would have you to disciple. Who would God have you to, to, to be a part of discipleship? Right? He calls us to not just be disciples, but make disciples. Who can you disciple? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend, a neighbor. Maybe you could host a Bible study in your home or at work. 
Maybe it's just you one-on-one -on -one with somebody over coffee. Listen, we've got resources we can give to you. We've got upstairs in, in one of our rooms by the office a whole shelf full of small group Bible studies. We can resource you. We can equip you. We can help you to do that. Our CHAMPS program, we're having a luncheon for those interested in our CHAMPS program. That's a way for you as an adult to do this for a child, to help be a part of the discipling of a child in our church. We want you to not only be taught, but to teach, to help other people, to invest in other people through discipleship. Because being a disciple must include making disciples. And again, if we're not doing that as a church, if you're not doing that as an individual, we're falling short. We're not fulfilling the Great Commission. How do you think the church in 70 years went from 120 people in an upper room to over a million spread throughout the Roman Empire. It was through multiplication. Addition is one thing. Addition is incremental growth. Christ calls us to multiply. That's exponential. One person once asked, how did a poor carpenter from a forsaken enslaved nation change the history of the world? And somebody answered, he used the power of multiplication. When you are a disciple because somebody led you to faith in Christ and you go lead others in faith to Christ and they lead others to faith in Christ, we are, ex we are just exponentially growing the kingdom of God. Now, all this I know seems daunting, right? I mean, just for me, multiplication is daunting because I'm not a math guy, right? I mean, I can, I can handle addition. You start getting multiplication, I start to struggle and sweat just a little bit, right? But math aside, this is daunting stuff. It's a little bit overwhelming, the, the weight of this. Nothing short of the hope of the world rests on the church fulfilling its mission. It's not Washington, D.C. or the U.N., thank the Lord. The hope of the world rests on what we do. So yeah, you may not fill up to the task. You may be saying, David, I'm, I'm not worthy of this. I'm not capable of this. I don't know enough. I can't teach other people. I can't make disciples. Listen, I know how you feel. Every Christian who's ever lived knows how you feel. That's why Jesus gave us three amazing promises. It's a command. It's three principles and three amazing promises. The first is he promised his authority. Jesus' authority is the foundation of the Great Commission. That's why he says it first. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He says that before he gives us the Great Commission. Our king has absolute authority over everyone and everything. That should give us boldness as we are his ambassadors to the world. Listen, you're not going to meet a single person out there over whom Jesus Christ doesn't have, have power and authority. You're not going to meet anybody out there who isn't under the sovereign rule of God Almighty. And you're not going to meet anybody out there that Jesus Christ doesn't love and didn't die to save. Therefore, we can boldly go and proclaim the good news of Christ. We can lovingly speak His truth into the lives of other people and unapologetically follow Jesus and make disciples who will follow Him as well. Because all authority is His. I think this is one of the reasons why people fail at the Great Commission is because we're afraid. We're, we're timid. We feel inadequate. Now here's the irony of that. So, so Christians, well-meaning Christians, they, they don't feel like they know enough, they don't feel like they're good enough, they don't feel like that they're capable. I'm not good with words. Remember Moses said that, the burning bush, and what did God do? He said, well, here's Aaron. You just tell him, I say, he'll say it. Think about Peter. He said, Lord, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And what did Jesus say? Peter, stand up, you're going to be a fisher of men. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, what did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. So we rightly feel inadequate, right? We're, we're in a long chain of people that rightly have felt inadequate and unworthy. But here's the irony that I'm, I'm seeing today. What happens is people feel inadequate to share the gospel, to tell other people how good Jesus is, but somehow they think that their life is good enough that if they just live a good Christian life in front of people, people are going to fall down and repent and give their life to Jesus. Really? Seriously? Lifestyle evangelism, right? I'm just going to be a witness by my lifestyle. Listen, my lifestyle isn't that good. I can't just live my life in front of people and expect them just to miraculously come to faith in Jesus. I've got to open my mouth and tell the good news. 
and so do you. Paul Washer said it this way, there is no way to preach the gospel with your life. And this is what the Baptist Faith Message says, you can affirm the gospel with your life, but you cannot preach the gospel with your life. You can only preach the gospel by opening your mouth and speaking forth the word of God. We heard that in our Old and New Testament readings this morning. Listen, I want to take some pressure off of this for you. You are inadequate. You are inadequate to bring anyone to faith in Jesus Christ. Because guess what? You're not the Holy Spirit. Okay? You can't convict anyone of sin. Because only the Holy Spirit can do that. You can't convince anyone of the gospel. Because only the Word of God can do that. And your life is not good enough to present the gospel on its own. Only the Word of God can do that. Does that take some pressure off of you? It's not up to you. All that's up to you is to be faithful to say yes when He gives you the opportunity to share your story. To share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else is up to Him. You don't have to convince them. You don't have to sway them. You don't have to convict them. You don't have to convert them. All you have to do is open your mouth and share the good news. Jesus promises us that we can do this in His authority, not our own. And secondly, in His presence. Yes, the Great Commission is a daunting task. And both Jesus and Paul told us to expect hardship and persecution and opposition. There are spiritual forces out there that want to keep you quiet. The opposition is real and it's scary, which is why Jesus ends the Great Commission saying, I am with you always. He says, remember, remember, don't forget this. I am with you always. He has promised us His authority, not ours. We go in His presence. He is with us as we go. And thirdly, He promises us His power. In Acts 1.8, He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses. It's the Spirit who enables us. And that happened on the day of Pentecost. And it happens whenever God's people pray for boldness, for courage, for compassion, for words and wisdom to make disciples. The Holy Spirit falls and fills us and empowers us to proclaim the good news. It really is like Jesus is at your side. Fighting with you, praying with you, blessing you when you give, empowering you when you go. I can't tell you how many times I've witnessed with people and and just discipled people and counseled people, and seriously, like words start coming out of my mouth. I'm like, that's pretty good. I didn't think that up. It's amazing when you feel and know the Holy Spirit is giving you the words to say. Listen, we must pray, we must give, we must go and make disciples of our neighbors, and of the nations. Baptize them. Bring them into a church family. Teach them, invest in them, and equip them. And we do all this in His power, in His presence, and in His authority. I pray that God will give each of us a sense of urgency for sharing the gospel, a deep and abiding burden for the lost, and an overwhelming confidence in His power, presence, and authority. That's my prayer for us. But maybe you're here today and you know that you need to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, you can't make disciples unless you are a disciple. You can't go and tell unless you've come and heard. You can't share Jesus unless you've received Jesus. And maybe you're sitting there today and you know that you need to come this morning and you need to, by faith, give your life to Jesus Christ and receive this amazing gift of salvation. The power of the cross we sang about earlier. All that Jesus, the wrath that he bore, the blame that he took, all that he suffered and endured for you. Maybe you need to come this morning and respond to that good news. Maybe you're a Christian and you've never been baptized. You need to come and make that step of obedience. It's hard to disciple others and have them be baptized and teach them to obey everything Jesus has commanded if you've not been baptized. Maybe that's what you need to do today is to come and say, David, I need to be baptized. I want to be serious about following Jesus. I want to be serious about being a disciple and making disciples. And it has to start with this. Maybe God is convicting you today about your level of praying or giving or going. Maybe he's burdening someone, uh, your heart with someone. You just want to come and pray at the altar for them to come to faith in Christ. Maybe God is calling you to unite with this church family. Whatever the Spirit of God is saying... Let's be obedient to all that Jesus says to us. Would you stand and pray with me?
Father, thank you for those people who shared the good news with us. Lord, we wouldn't be here today. We who are believers and followers of Jesus Christ would not be here today if it wasn't for someone else obeying that great commission and sharing the gospel with us, and helping us to follow you in believers' baptism and becoming a part of a church and growing in our faith. Lord, we pray your blessings upon the ministries and the efforts, the programs, the outreaches of this church, the, the missionaries and groups that we support. We pray you bless them and magnify every dollar that's given and may your spirit bless and equip them and empower them and what they do. Protect them, Father. But God, help us to realize that we also live on mission right here in Thompson, Georgia. Burden our hearts. Break our hearts for the lost. Help us to step out in faith and trust your power, presence, and authority as we share the gospel with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Facing the task unfinished that drives us to our knees My prayer for us as we go is that we would go to our world. You have got a mission field. You've got people in your life that you have a connection with and a relationship to that I don't. And God has put people in your orbit so that you can unfurl that banner of hope for them. That they could know the peace, love, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And I pray for you as you go this week that you would go with that Boldness because of his presence and authority and his power at work in and through you. Let's go and proclaim that good news to others. Let's not walk out these doors, this threshold, and forget <laughs> what we are here for. Amen? Amen? And as we go, we have an opportunity to give at our boxes uh, and, and to just live out the calling that God has placed upon us. Michael came this morning to rededicate his life to Jesus Christ. We visited earlier this week, and, and we talked about that. And so he came forward because he wanted to publicly acknowledge that he wants to be more serious about serving other people and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't we all? Don't we all? Let me pray for us, and then we're going to go out singing the chorus of Days of Elijah. Father, thank you for Michael. Thank you, Lord, for, for your spirit working in his life. And we pray, God, that you would help him as you would help us all.
to live into the baptism that we've received. Lord, to live out this salvation that you have worked into us. God, that your word and your work in us would not be fruitless and void, but that through us you'd accomplish your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's sing this together. One, two, behold. He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. God bless you. It's the good news that he's coming back. Let it give you some urgency this week.